So some Owen diagnosed, with some Owen seems to be coming through. Uh, diagnosed uh, asthma, age three, seasonal hay fever, eczema, non-smoker, no family history of asthma, no history of aspirin uh, intolerance. Five, exacerbation of asthma over the last year, requiring systemic steroids, um, wheeze, chest tightness, he's got the whole works. Um, uses salbutamol up to 20 times a day, wakes up frequently, it's about as bad as he can get. He's on fluticasone, uh, uh, 500 micrograms a day, salmeterol um, and salbutamol. His spirometry has got uh, moderately severe airways obstruction. Um, so there's additional investigation. Serum eosinophil 0.45, um, total IgE 1500, and as aspergillus rast, you know, we often do that to look for aspergillus lung disease was actually only one plus, that doesn't mean anything. So, um, what uh, predominant cell do you think he's got in his airway? Yeah, so it looks like he's going to be predominantly uh, eosinophilic, and that's turned out what he was. He had about, uh, I think, 18% uh, eosinophils in his airway, and his um, neutrophils were about 45%. So he was a predominantly eosinophilic patient. And which of the following changes to treatment would you consider? Would you increase the dose of inhaled steroids, uh, increase the dose of his LABA, change to combination therapy, give him oral steroids, leukotriene antagonist, course of our omaclide, uh, atrovent um, or spareva, uh, and or I mean and then spareva, and then uh, or else just keep him going as he is. So what would people do? Uh, who would go for this one? A. Yeah, that'd be a reasonable strategy, wouldn't it? He's got eosinophils, he's not on maximal dose, so you could uh, maximise that. Increased dose of LABA, he's already on maximal treatment. Change to a combination, a lot of people would do that in the, historically, but I'm telling you today, better to target your uh, approach rather than just put them on this combination. Um, what about course of oral steroids? You could argue for that, I mean, if, if, depending on what you're trying to achieve, but. If you really wanted to try and get him onto a better control, you might give him a couple of weeks of this as well as doing this to try and get him up to another another level of control. Add in a leukotriene antagonist. Anybody want to do that? I think it's, made, it's got a very small effect. It's probably thought on average to be equivalent to about 100 micrograms of beclomethasone a day. So it's not something you, you'd be wanting to do in this situation. And it's probably best reserved for people who've got aspirin hypersensitivity. Uh, they're the ones that seem to um, benefit most. What about a macrolide? You know, he didn't have enough neutrophils there to consider that. Um, it, depending on how you get on with all of this, if he's still obstructed, then you could consider that, of course. Okay. How are we going? Yeah, so my first choice was go for a higher dose of inhaled steroid. Patient 2, 29-year-old, a homemaker, diagnosed asthma, age 5, so long history of asthma. If you've got it diagnosed earlier on, it makes it more likely and particularly if she's atopic, rhinitis and eczema, um, very strong family history, tampak, your smoking history, occasional rec recreational cannabis, uh, no documented history of aspirin uh, hypersensitivity, um, and she was previously diagnosed, hospitalized with pneumonia two years ago, two moderately severe exacerbations of asthma. She gains very wheezy and breathless and uh, has current <coughs> symptoms, and um, her tr current triggers are dairy food and dusty environments, and she's using salbutamol daily. Uh, so medications, again, she's on uh, separate doses of salmeterol and fluticasone. Uh, she's again got obstructive um, uh, obspirometry, and uh, she's again got a serum eosinophil level of 0.53. She's got very elevated total IgE and no RAST, and her exhaled nitric oxide level is elevated. So which group would you put her into? Anybody? She's likely to be eosinophilic or, or she could be mixed. I think anybody that's got such severe airways obstruction will be either A or C, given what I've just uh, told you. Um, she actually ended up having C. That's the most difficult group to treat, as I mentioned to you previously. Um, but you wouldn't be able to tell that until you actually do the test. And that's why I would say that in New Zealand, 
each regional centre, there should be induced sputum set testing available to each regional centre. You know, you should be able to have this as a backup because you wouldn't be able to diagnose this particular situation in that patient unless you had that test available to you. So what are you, you going to do for her? <coughs> Anybody give her oral steroids? What about uh, adding an atrovent and considering spireva? Change her onto serotide. Um, your oral steroids or increase the dose from health steroids. Add, go through all those things. So what are we going to do here? Who would go for that? Yeah, I think she's, only, she's not on a maximal dose from health steroid. I would go for a, a higher dose. Because of what we are saying previously about flixotide, personally <coughs> would take her off flixotide and give her another one because she's going to have bugs in there as well. Um, uh, I don't think you'd be doing this, this early on. Uh, you want to try and maximise control of the inf inflammation. Uh, for the reasons I'm saying, because we want to maximise uh, the inhaled steroid uh, first, I wouldn't be transferring her onto a combination until that had been achieved. You could argue for this um, if you wanted to again in the situation, not that. Um, that is also possible, <coughs> but I would tend to try and get this first and then consider a course of microlide. Um, this is if you've, everything else is failing because she's got a very, very high level of I, IgE. With her compliance issues set, it means would she not just consider the, the smart or something like that? Yeah, this is it. By her own admission, she gets worse when she forgets her hands. Yeah, I, I agree. You certainly wouldn't give her the, um, would, wouldn't give her that without first dealing with the, and you know, she'd have to be fully adherent, so yeah, you, you'd, you'd, you'd deal with that, I agree. Mm. So you do, uh, you'd increase um, the uh, inhaled steroids would be the first thing you did. Um, you could actually add in that as well, but I would uh, uh, maximise the anti-inflammatory first, and then I would consider a course of oral macular. So she needs a lot of things uh, to be done to her if we're going to make any difference to her uh, outcome, and it's only later that you'd consider these other alternatives. And you probably refer to the patient Yeah, she needs a bit of, she needs a top up from everybody. <coughs> Uh, EH, uh, school teacher, asthma 30, hay fever, she has gourd, um, no history of aspirin sensitivity, non-smoker, mother and uncle have asthma, she's a poor perceiver of asthma symptoms, multiplication of friends notice a wheeze and breathless before she does, she's not recognised any specific triggers for asthma, she thinks it's mainly chest infections, she, she experiences it up to five times a year often lasting for you know, a few weeks and months at a time, and um, usually reaches for an antibiotic. So she's on Simbacort and uh, Cetrazine and Salbutamol. She's got um, uh, obstructed airways disease as well. Serum eosinophil level 0.23. Total IgE, she's got a mild elevation of IgE, and her RAST is negative, and her <coughs> exhaled, uh, her eno is in the normal range. So, um, which group do you think she's going to be in? Anybody? Yeah, she's likely to be in the neutrophilic group because of that um, low normal eosinophil count. And her neutrophils were 85% predicted. Um, and um, so which of the following treatments are you going to consider for her? You're going to give her a course of macrolide <coughs> antibiotic. And as you'll see in my next presentation, it depends on how long she's been symptomatic for as to how long you would give her a course for. But if she's been having lots of exacerbations and never getting really well in the meantime, she'll probably need at least six weeks and she may even require a three months course of uh, roxithromycin. And I wouldn't be doing that as a, a GP necessarily, but I'd certainly consider giving her a month course of romycin uh, if she's had this protracted uh, you know, problematic course. I don't think she probably needs a reduction in dose of inhaled steroid at this stage because she's not on a, on a large dose and she's on um, budesonide. Um, this is a 65 year old man with recurrent bronchitis, aspirin childhood, non smoker, mildly dyspnea, spirometry uh, is okay. Nil inhalers, what do you think is going on there? Have you looked at the results? So there's FEV1. 2.3, 409% predicted. FEC, 127% predicted. Ratio is 65% um, uh, predicted. Any comments?
2.34 over 3.63, 65% pr predictors. Anybody going to comment on that? He's basically, uh, despite having normal lung spirometric volumes, he's got some airways obstruction here, hasn't he? It should be greater than 70%. And if you go down here and have a look at the uh, expiratory flow volume loop, this is sort of downward scalloping. This is the point I was making before. This is the FEF 2575. It's only 56% predicted. This man has damaged small airways. So he's got normal FEV1, but uh, he's got recurrent bronchitis and he gets breathless on hills because he suffers from dynamic hyperinflation, which is caused by early closure of already narrowed small airways. When you start to recruit from your chest wall muscles and from your diaphragm, and what happens is he closes off before his airway has gone through and he ends up hyperinflating and breathing up here. And so I would send him to Sarah and I would uh, treat him with a macrolide antibiotic for his um, infective exacerbations, put him on the flu vaccination. Um, what about this guy? He's got an FEV1 of um, 0.89 over FVC of 2.56, so his FEV1's 32% um, predicted. What do, you, what do you think? It's after Simbacourt. Would you think he uh, uh, complies with the criteria for Spireva if he's, if he's breathless? Yeah, so that was an easy one. Um, <coughs> this is um, a lady that um, I inherited from Wellington. Uh, she's a 37 year old. Came up from the Wellington Respiratory Clinic. She had uh, asthma since um, uh, the age of 23. She'd been under their care for 10 years with really severe asthma. 23% predicted was uh, her FEV1. Um, this is what she was on when she came out. So submaximal dose of inhaled steroid. Um, maybe they're, uh, you know, they believe that you don't get any extra benefit after 500 micrograms. Frequent courses of steroids, 10 in the last year. Multiple skin sensitivities. Eosinophil count was 0.48. Total IgE was elevated. RAS negative did a sputum on her and she had mixed eosinophils and neutrophils. She's also got a few lipid-laden macrophages, which I'll tell about later. She had sinusitis on a CT scan. So what are your suggested treatment options? You could, you could enter into a whole raft of things. This is what I did. First of all, I increased her flexitide to 1,000, and her FEV went up from 0.79 over to 0.93 over a six-month period. And I said, you're feeling better? She said, not much. Thank you very much, though. Um, <laughs> I said, OK. Uh, so the next thing I did was, because she had neutrophils in her airway, I gave her a, a good long course of three months with the macrolide. Uh, and actually, she actually had a further small improvement. It might have been just that she was still improving. Remember the flat dose response curve? I think that was probably having more effect. Although a cough reduced on the romycin, and she said she felt as though she could breathe a little bit more easily. So she was generally happier with things. And so I said, at that stage, QVAR wasn't funded. But I said, this is what I would do if I were you. And so she agreed <coughs> because she was so desperate. And this wasn't, th I've got, I had about 20 or 30 patients on QVAR before it got funded. This is what happened to her FEV1. Went up from 1.05 to 1.3. And her FEF 2575 went up from 35 predicted to 53% predicted. She substantially improved her breathlessness. And she said, that's the best I've felt that I can ever remember. And so I said, OK, now we're going to start dealing with the other th issues. Mm -hmm. I sent it to the ear, nose, and throat guys. They drained the sinuses. And uh, her cough improved further. It was mainly cough improved. I think this was just her still improving. There's a flat dose response curve. I think this is still maximal dose of inhaled steroid. Still working a year afterwards, still making a difference. Because she had polyps noted at the time of things, I thought, well, maybe she's got asthma and hypersensitivity. It's called Samter's triad. I sent it to the immunologist. Sure enough, she did. And they desensitized her to aspirin. And she actually, a cough resolved. And her FEV went up even further. Again, it might be still further benefit from the inhaled steroids. But she still had an FEV1 of less than 60% predicted. So I put her on Spireva. And up she went to 1.87. That was in 2009. She's back working. She hadn't worked for about 10 years. And since then, I've kept looking after her. She's never been as good as that. But she soldiers on pretty well. Um, and um, uh, she's somebody who I think we probably should be looking at giving her um, omalimazab because she's got a to high total IgE. Um, this is a 32-year-old, very sad case. She was training for the Sydney Olympics. 
Uh, she pulled out of the New York Marathon um, because of chest tightness, cough, and acute breathlessness at the 20 mile mark. No previous history of any respiratory problems, no risk factors for asthma, but she wanted to break the qualifying mark, so she went into two other marathons too soon afterwards, pulled out of them both with exactly the same symptoms, wheezing and that. I've got pictures of her on the side of the marathon track, bent over double, um, very distressed, and uh, being look, surrounded by people. And she didn't make the qualifying time. She was very, very distressed. She was seen by the US uh, Olympic Committee, uh, Olympic um, uh, running doctor who was looking after the Olympic American athletes. He placed her on inhaled medications and said she had asthma. And he gave her Singulair and Newlin as well as all this. Probably made her feel <coughs> nauseated. Um, but it didn't make any difference to her symptoms. So by the time I saw her, she'd failed, the time had run out. But I did a full investigation. She didn't have any hyperreactive airways. Spirometry was absolutely normal. Epheno was totally normal. Juice butant was normal for uh, eosinophils and neutrophils, but she was absolutely laden with lipid-laden macrophages. So those are fat cells sitting in the macrophages. She's been microaspirating. Well, she had high volume reflux, and that's what caused her to stop the marathon, probably caused by gastric stasis. She didn't have asthma. She needed to um, basically uh, not uh, to look at her food, what she was eating on the, on the race, and, and uh, take some LOSEC before the marathon, and she would have done OK. She actually, um, uh, yeah, anyway, I won't go on about that. She was, she was very upset um, that they hadn't been diagnosed because she lived to race in the marathon. Um, Last case report, 47-year-old woman with lifelong asthma, steroid dependent, frequent exacerbations, um, FEV1 47% with 15% reversibility. And here she is on HRCT, she's got gas trapping. It's uh, looking at small airways disease. Her ENO is just elevated. Serum eosinophils are in that sort of mid-range, probably low, low normal. And uh, eosinophils here is just below the um, range, but the neutrophils are very positive. Um, she had been on uh, inhaled steroids, I think, for about, uh, yeah, lots of, for the last five years, steroid dependent, and on um, uh, those who inhaled steroid. I put her on roxetromycin for three months. A year later, she's steroid free. She's still got some airways obstruction. She's a bit like that, um, uh, that uh, spirometry thing that I showed you but she's actually off all inhaled medication. She's on the flu vaccination and she's, um, she's, she's more than happy. So she probably developed uh, some damage to her small airways earlier in life and um, her major problem is sort of functional airways disease rather than asthma. So I was gonna quickly talk about antibiotics because you know, we've already talked about maximization of inhaled steroids in relationship to, um, uh, in relationship to asthma. But I think it's fair to say that the respiratory world really uh, hasn't yet worked out um, what I think is a reasonable strategy in terms of how we mass manage neutrophilic inflammation. Um, but this is just to remind you, this is the CT scan of bronchiectasis, which is at the severe end of the neutrophilic uh, inflammation uh, package. But if you go back into the COPD smoking related or even into the um, people who've got functional uh, small airways uh, disease and you look hard enough for it, you'll find evidence of uh, colonization with, uh, with microorganisms. The most commonly found is Haemophilus influenzae, followed by Strep pneumoniae and Moraxella. Uh, if you end up with Pseudomonas, it's usual that it's, uh, you're at more severe, advanced stage. But I have seen two or three patients, including a supermodel recently, who were colonized with Pseudomonas, despite really only having very mild functional small airways damage. That's not a good thing to happen, as you'll uh, see in a minute. In the neutrophilic, the group that um, have been historically identified as having neutrophilic asthma, uh, one of the groups in Boston hasn't, they've not yet published it, but they used um, very sensitive RNA testing to look at the neutrophil, uh, neutrophilic asthma subgroup, and they found that on every occasion they actually identified these organisms with RNA, even though there were not enough organisms down there necessarily to come up as culture positive, these people are all colonized uh, to some extent with, uh, with bacteria. Now this is just a slide to point out to you that uh, as a sort of, uh, uh, when you're seeing a patient and they're coughing up sputum, 
we sort of say to you, well, what's it? you want to know what the volume of sputum is, but you also want to know what it looks like. So if you've got a sputum that looks white or mucoid down that end, and you've got neutrophilic inflammation, then their bacterial load will be small. Conversely, if it's dark green at this end, their bacterial load will be high. And that's been proven by Rob Stockley, who's um, from Birmingham, and he's basically just showing you the bacterial load. So if it's mucoid down this end, they're, um, you can actually look for bacteria, but they're relatively low in numbers, still 10 to the power of 5, as opposed to the mucoporolent group up this end where there's just more bacteria present. Um, and then that's it in summary, really, just making the point that if you're down this end, your bacterial load's lower than at the other end. Um, so, uh, obviously at the moment, the only thing that we've really got to offer for this group is antibiotics. Uh, it's obviously the mainstay of management of bronchiectasis, but it's also become the mainstay of neutrophilic inflammation, along with airway clearance, and that's why I wanted to stress the importance of that with the use of AIRVO and with the use of Sarah's techniques. So the question then about, you know, when do you use antibiotics and which one and for how long? And um, probably the best place to direct you to in terms of looking at bronchiectasis uh, and, uh, is to look at thorax and the ERS because they give very good, I think, uh, guideline -driven, uh, guide, uh, I mean, uh, evidence-driven guidelines for the management of infections. And this is saying, well, if it's purulent, uh, is it always purulent or is it intermittently purulent? And that's going to influence it and whether is Pseudomonas present or not. Um, basically, uh, they will use in bronchiectasis two-week courses because it's going to take longer for patients to recover than a standard five- or seven-day course. But you can uh, increase that to one month, and I think that's reasonable in general practice if patients aren't recovering with a two-week course. So if you've got somebody with an exacerbation of bronchiectasis, I think it's reasonable to prescribe it and make a tentative course to see them in two weeks' time, because if they're not fully recovered, then incre uh, prolonging the antibiotics is a reasonable strategy. And so I'm not going to go through these in any detail. Uh, they're directed at, uh, at the organism that you're looking for. I guess the point I would make about this is that when you see your patients, even if they just turned up for some other reason, have a low threshold to getting their sputum examined for culture, because if they've got these bugs here, it is going to direct your antibiotic strategy and it's going to particularly make you concerned if they've got um, uh, Pseudomonas uh, in their airways. Um, so um, again, this is just, I'm not going to go through these because you can read these for yourself. Um, but what's not in the guidelines yet is really how best to use um, these macrolide antibiotics. Um, most of them are driven towards you know, uh, penicillin sort of uh, based and because of the emerging resistance of Haemophilus influenza to amoxicillin by itself, then uh, people are increasingly using um, Augmentin, which is understandable. In New Zealand, the um, amoxicillin sense uh, resistant uh, strains of Haemophilus are actually very low in number uh, compared with the UK and particularly in compared with, um, with Europe. Uh, so Pseudomonas, we just need to uh, make a point that if Pseudomonas is present, it's associated, no matter what the cause of the inflammatory airways disorder, it's associated with uh, a greater decline in lung function. If, uh, it's associated with more uh, effective exacerbations and worse quality <laughs> of life. So being colonized with pseudomonas is not a good thing to occur. Um, <clears throat> so what do you use? Well, um, you obviously use a quinolone, ciprofloxacin, as um, previously mentioned. But if despite that, um, you end up with Pseudomonas frequently being found, then you've got a problem, um, particularly since if you overuse uh, your quinolones, you might end up with Achilles tendonitis, which is a nasty <coughs> side effect of uh, quinolones. And so you have to think about alternative strategies. And uh, this is where we get stuck in New Zealand because we cannot use nebulized TOBI other than for patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, so what we have done is we've come up with nebulized gentamicin as a strategy um, at Middlemore, and we have a protocol for that which has been developed in association with the pharmacy department. Um, and so that's the, uh, um, in terms of the evidence, nebulized tobramycin improves quality of life symptoms, reduces pseudomonas density, but doesn't necessarily eradicate it. 
and reduces hospitalizations. But it has a high incidence of adverse events. I've found that when I've used it, it sort of works for a while, but after about two months, they become intolerant of it. They start coughing and it irritates their airway. <coughs> We've found gentamicin in the two patients I've used seem to be better tolerated over a period of time. And I think around the corner, um, there's going to be nebulized ciprofloxacin, which may be uh, a better alternative than the other two. Uh, Callistin is used by my colleagues over in, um, uh, in Brompton more frequently, but uh, in fact it doesn't have any different, doesn't have any effect in the time to exacerbation, but it does improve uh, pseudomonas density and quality of life. Um, I won't go into intravenous antibiotics because I think it's not relevant to you, but I will talk about azithromycin um, because it does have benefit in uh, both uh, chronic bronchitis due to COPD, but also in terms of uh, treatment of bronchiectasis. And these are randomized controlled trials using uh, azithromycin over six months to a year. And so this is uh, the study that was undertaken at Middlemore, which was undertaken by Conroy Wong, which was published in Lancet. Uh, this is the one from Netherlands. Uh, Australia used azithromycin, and there was another one done in Australia and New Zealand um, using children's. So these were long-term courses of macrolide antibiotics. And what you find is that you reduce the um, time to first exacerbation, which is where its main benefit is, um, and um, uh, you also, because of that, you generally improve their uh, quality of life. The problem is that once you get past three months, you begin to increase the uh, evidence of uh, antibiotic resistance. And so I think we have some major concerns. You know, on the one hand, it's good treatment, and macrolides work better because they're not only having an antibiotic effect, but they've got an anti-inflammatory effect as well. And it's generally our belief that most of the anti-inflammatory um, benefits are derived between six, month, uh, six weeks and three months. But the way we've decided to use this, I don't think GPs should be using this uh, over three months. I think it should be consultant-led at the moment, but I'm not using it for more than three months, and I'm using it in patients who are having frequent exacerbations, you know, despite uh, our best efforts, and who have neutrophilic inflammation, and in whom you've tried everything else. Um, but I think in your case, what I would do is you could probably use it for upwards of a month, um, but I wouldn't, I'd cop out of that, because I think otherwise we're gonna end up with uh, antibiotic resistance beginning to emerge in our population. But you can see the benefits here, whether you look at the EMBRACE study or the BAT, time to first exacerbation obviously substantially helped, and lung function, small improvement, and this quality of life, small improvement as well. So I think that's it for the day. Your uh, ability to, um, to stay with it is commendable. Um, and um, I'm just going to end up with just a summary, really. I was going to show you the, not sure how you, how do I get that? Um, uh, it's not going to work. I had a picture of the, I had a video of the robot, but it hasn't downloaded. So um, I don't think I'll go on to that. I think we've had enough of. So um, this is just a, what I think the take home messages really today in relationship to COPD management is <coughs> let's all try and uh, diagnose more and we can do that by using screening questionnaires and getting uh, a spirometry up and going. Uh, I think as groups uh, you should try and improve flu vaccination rates and consider Pneumovax with Valent 13. Uh, we're all trying to improve smoking cessation rates, try and reduce inhaled steroids and use, uh, we need to increase the use of long-acting uh, anti-muscarinics because our prescription rate is lower than that of other OECD countries. Uh, we need to obviously increase pulmonary rehabilitation um, and we need to um, uh, look more closely at high-risk individuals and uh, try and achieve more cost-effective telehealth uh, introductions and try and overall reduce costs because if we can achieve that we can reinvest it in the things that really do work such as pulmonary rehabilitation and employing more nurses and uh, more physios to help support the uh, burden of chronic illness. So uh, we've developed a, a dynamic uh, electronic pathway which we're evaluating, uh, which integrates with the GP record. 
which actually helps support all of those processes. So maybe if we ever get a chance in a year or two, we'll come back and talk about uh, whether it's working. And if it is working, we can share it with the rest of New Zealand. So uh, on behalf of the others that have um, uh, helped today, uh, Sarah and Nicola, thank you for your attention. Thanks for being invited down here. And um, good luck for the future.